Guys, this is Mubeen. Thank you very much for being here. Before you watch this video, I wanted to make sure that you are aware that this video is for the educational purpose only. All of the material on Dr. Bean and all the material that I present is for educational purpose, especially for healthcare workers who are studying or who are practicing. So do not use these videos to self-medicate. So uh, let's look at this for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. This is the book reference. I'm giving you the book reference so that we are, it's not just Mubin saying something. It is Goodman Gilman 13th edition. And look at the safety margin is narrow. A single dose of 30 milligram per kilogram may be fatal. It can kill the person. Cardiovascular effects include hypotension, vasodilatation, suppressed myocardial function, cardiac arrhythmias. Arrhythmias can cause death and eventual cardiac arrest. That means death. Confusion, convulsions and coma may also result from overdose. Chloroquine doses of more than 5 gram given parentally usually are fatal. They're just fatal. They just kill the person. Look at the GIT upset. Headache, visual disturbances and urticaria. Pruritus itching on the screen uh, skin also occurs most commonly among dark skinned people prolonged treatment with suppressive doses occasionally cause side effects such as headache blurring of the vision diplopia confusion convulsions uh, convulsions you know the uh, lic uh, lichnoid skin eruptions bleaching of hair and look at this widening of the qrs interval and t wave abnormalities these things can lead to the uh, cardiac arrhythmias Cause toxic myopathies, heart issues, toxic heart issues. Heart can be, heart can stop. It can be so damaged. Cardio myop, cardiopathies and peripheral neuropathies. So please do not take these drugs without doctor's prescription. Rarely neuropsychiatric disturbances, including suicide, may be related to overdose. Chloroquine inhibits CYP2D6, this is an enzyme that helps with the, uh, the liver with the uh, metabolism of various things and thus can interact with variety of different drugs. Chloroquine opposes the action of anticonvulsants and increases the risk of ventricular arrhythmia with co when co-administered with amiodrone or halofantrine. So guys, let us also see uh, the toxicities of remdesivir and then azithromycin. Remdesivir is not FDA approved. So there is not sufficient data to understand what is the effectivity of this medicine and what is the safe margin of this medical, uh, this medicine. Dangerous. And FDA says the data collected from the expanded access program may contribute to the agency's understanding of the drug. They're still trying to figure it out but controlled clinical trials are needed to determine if it's safe and effective for the treatment of COVID-19 infections. And let's look at the azithromycin as well. We're going to talk about it, the z -pack. So oral or intravenous administration of erythromycin frequently is accompanied by moderate to severe epigastric distress. Again, this is Goodman-Gilman 13th edition pharmacology textbook. Erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, and Telithromycin have been reported to cause cardiac arrhythmias, which means death, including QT prolongation with ventricular tachycardia, which can result into that death depending upon what your body situation is. Hepatotoxicity, liver damage, has been observed. Allergic reactions, fever, eosinophilia, skin eruptions, auditory impairments and tinnitus. Then these drugs strongly inhibit, azithromycin strongly inhibits CYP3A4 causing significant drug interactions. If you're taking any other drug, this can actually make the matters worse. Guys, this is Mubeen. Welcome. Today we are going to talk about the COVID-19's management principles. The disclaimer here is that the... Um, the principle that I'm going to go through, this is a pandemic that is ongoing. There are so many countries, so many doctors that are right now fighting this war. And they all have their own experiences. They all have their own go-to medicines and they all have their own uh, needs. And the patients are different. The population types are different. 
ages are different, comorbidities are different. So hence over here, when even the CDC and WHOs are kind of hedging about the um, treatment and management approaches, I do not want to be sitting here prescribing a management structure. I just cannot. I do not have enough knowledge and the knowledge is continuing to evolve. So take this as a curation, as a collection of the data that I have collected from the people who are working on, on the patients and they have various drugs that they have tried and then reported for their success or failure. And this would happen that in the future, more clinical trials will be done, more studies will be done that would then come back and say that these observations, these papers, these reports, these articles, these observations by the doctors were correct or not. So what I'm going to present here is the um, curation of all of that material and not a hard and fast uh, management rule that should be applied everywhere. So let's start. First of all, the thing that we should um, understand is that a pandemic is managed overall, the bigger thing is managed in three steps. One is the, the first step is, for example, to contain the pandemic. The second step is to delay it. And the third step is to mitigate that. Now, <clears throat> Containment means that we try to reduce the number of people who are going to become ill. And how do we do that? We do that by a lot of contact tracing. Contact tracing. What does that mean? That means if I am sick and I'm a confirmed case, then they're going to figure out where have I been? Who else have I come in contact with? Who else may have become sick because of me? So that is contact tracing. Then, of course, lots and lots, lots of testing. So if you suspect that I am a case of, let's say, COVID-19, then you should test me. And if you suspect that I have been around this person B, then you should test them. And so you keep doing lots and lots of testing to figure out who are the ill in the society. So lots of testing and lots of contact tracing to then figure out how do we quarantine them or how do we isolate them, how do we give them time to heal or how do we support them to heal without others becoming infected. So in here, in this step, I think China and uh, South Korea, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore, they did some great job. I really am impressed by South Korea's model and I think that they had developed that model after they got a um, lot of heat in 2015 when the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome was brought into South Korea and there were lots of deaths. So since then they had a protocol, WHO gave them some, some advice and they developed protocols which they deployed this time and they did a tremendous job. Not only they kept the death rate contained, they also contained the illness itself. So here I have a few studies that I would just like to quickly go over. This is one, South Korea is reporting intimate details of COVID-19 cases. Um, and then similarly, here is one more in Science Mag. Coronavirus cases have dropped sharply in South Korea. What's the secret? So what South Korea did which was really interesting. And really, uh, China did a great job in the same containment phase. They did quarantine, quarantine. they did a lots and lots of uh, isolation. They did really um, aggressive steps. On the other hand, South Korea, seemingly not aggressive steps, not authoritarian steps, but still beautifully managed. Although in the Western countries, some of us would say, Maybe there were human rights issues, but check this out. What they had done was they used, so this, they had uh, created laws in 2015 to be able to do what I'm going to show you here. One, 
they were able to in such case of a pandemic or an outbreak they, they were able to track people's transactions so when you use a credit card somewhere and if you are a patient they had the government had the right to go in and pull all that data to see where you have been and then tell the people around there to say there has been a patient of covid-19 so they were taking transaction data the debit card credit card data that is one second they were taking the phone data from the towers so when you are moving around with your phone you are moving from one tower to another tower area and the towers can actually tell where have you been so they were able to take the phone tower data and then figure out where have you been and then they had apps and communications where they would send a message to say hey people there was somebody of this age and gender around you at this time they were so specific that in certain cases they were able to tell who a covid-19 patient has been in a hotel room and they were able to tell the people around that so that is how much they were doing and then uh, of course the other data for example cctv data where they could track you through the cameras and see what have you been doing so with these three type of data collection they were able to do a lots of contact tra tracing they were able to find where you were and who are the people who came in contact with you and who were at risk with that they did a huge amount of testing so probably the largest volume of testing done in this pandemic is i think by them maybe after china or with china so that testing was they would have drive in testing so you go in there you get yourself tested and they would just keep testing and keep finding out people who may be sick so that early detection that time when you are not even symptomatic and they are suspecting that you may be allowed them to start managing people early on and start isolating them and start preventing others from becoming sick and reduce the death rate and reduce the pandemic or outbreak itself as well so that was one way of managing and containing so this was containment china did a great job with the containment as well i think that there is uh, some something to say about italy's containment um, approach the the southeast asian countries they are now i think are not doing a great job with the containment so we'll see what is going on over there but containment is an important step and there are some countries which have brilliantly shown how containment can work so that is one the second is delay so in case of delay what we are expecting is that see let's say that we have 100000 people and out of 100000 people let's say 40% are going to become sick this virus is going to get into them one way or the other in 40 for the 40% of the cases then the herd immunity may develop and it may happen that it would become slower to get into the rest of the people so now the thing is if we allow them all so i'm talking about delay now if we allow them all let's take a hypo hypothetical case that all 100000 people become sick within one week and let's say 40% of them so all 100000 people got exposed 40% of them would become sick that is 40000 people and then let's say uh, out of those 10000 are going to become critically ill now the 10000 who are critically ill their let's say 10000 their need for medical resources within a week will be tremendous and that is where when the medical resources will be depleted then the deaths would start occurring because there are not enough beds and nurses and staff and ventilators and oxygen and everything available to take care of them this is what's happening in italy they are having a, having to prioritize that who gets the resources because they do not have enough resources so they are taking in this pandemic they are 
keeping the older ages less prioritized. However, if the same disease, same number of people became sick over a longer period of time, this is what everybody keeps saying, flattening the peak. If they become sick over a longer period of time, then what would happen is that at any one time, the burden on the medical resources will be less and hopefully manageable. And that is when more lives can be saved. So instead of 4% death rate, or like Italy, I think now 8% death rate, maybe the death rate will be contained within 1% or even lesser than that. But that is only possible if we can flatten the curve. So this is why when people keep coming up to me and say, you know what, flu is a bigger problem and it has killed more and it is in more people, I understand that. But this is a disease that is spreading. It is going to spread like flu as well. Hopefully it would not recur every year like flu once we develop the immunity and we'll be fine. So this is one time. But if we allow the whole world, if we stop all preventative measures, if we stop all containments and delays and we just sit back and say, you know what, let it happen. And imagine 40% of the population become sick. Imagine out of them, 20% needing the hospital resources. Can you imagine the millions of people that would need medical resources, which we do not have? So slowing down the peak is important. And also realize that this is incremental need from medical resources. It's not yearly influenza or flu season for which most of the time countries are ready. We are not ready for this. We do not have resources allocated for this. This is a surprise. So all of a sudden we have a bunch of new cases that are competing for the same resources which were allocated and, and planned for other uh, routine expected uh, diseases. So that is a delay. So if we can delay it, that would be awesome. And how do we delay that? Look, we delay that by, by social distancing. Social distancing. What is that in this virus's case? So every disease may need to be delayed in different ways. So here we need the social distancing that people are away from each other at least six feet. They are not uh, handshaking, they're not doing social kissing, they're not doing hugs, they are not gatherings. I keep, uh, I'm surprised when somebody comes out, a mayor comes out and says, not more than 100 people. Well, what the heck, those 100 people who are going to get sick are going to go make more people sick. So the gatherings should not even be more than one person, one person gatherings. So stay isolated at home, work from home, and that is a social distancing. That is important. That doesn't mean people will not become sick. It still is going to be the case that people are going to continue to become sick, but they would become sick at a slower rate. And that allows the medical facilities to be able to operate optimally and save more lives and reduce misery. So social distancing is one, one such thing. Reduced gatherings is another. And the don't do the handshakes, no social kiss, kissings, no hugs and so on. So that is, these are the processes for delay. Then finally, there is mitigation. So what do you think? Which country did a great job with the delay as well? So China did a great job with the delay. They locked people in their buildings. They, they locked them in their houses. They picked people up who were sick and brought them into the places where they were quarantining them. So that was an a great effort on flattening the peak. South Korea did the delay by doing the containment, efficient containment and doing the contact tracing and testing and then managing those patients quickly. So that also helped in delay. And uh, I think that there are countries you can see that are not helping with the delay. UK is an example. Italy is another example. Um, I'm afraid to say maybe US is another example. So we have to make sure that we are better. And finally is the mitigation. What is mitigation? This is where we actually now start managing the people who have become sick. And we start making sure that there is not enough burden on the resources that the important crucial services 
stop working. So we keep the lights on for the countries, we keep the services going, and we keep the people, people managed, the patients managed. So that is a mitigation. So I've talked about the um, containment and delay. I want to talk about mitigation. What are the ways the disease has been managed? And I want to talk about the drugs and I want to talk about the procedures. So let's look at the stages of the disease. I have numerous times I have discussed the stages or severities of the disease. And this is the WHO's definition. In the severity, we have the mild case. So in the mild case, what we are saying is that there is fever. 98% of the patients may have fever, will have fever. Then there is cough, dry cough. <coughs> this is dry cough. 78% of the people would have dry cough. And then there may be sore throat and there may be um, hemoptysis and there may be GIT disturbance, I think in 3%. So there are some other um, issues as well that can happen, but fever and cough and shortness of breath are more important. Now, shortness of breath does not sit in the mild side. Fever and cough are something that are um, going to be in the mild side. Now, if this is the case, and 81% of the patients, we have talked this many, many times, 81% of the patients are going to fall into, into this mild uh, severity of the disease. Most of these folks can be managed by isolation, that is, ask them to please stay home, by containment, ask them to just be quarantined at home with their families. Maybe they take something for the fever, they take something for the cough. If they are deficient in vitamin D, they take some vitamin D supplements and they take plenty of water, food, uh, so that they are healthy and they would be okay uh, in majority of the cases. So that is the mild case. In here, medical management is really not needed. So medical uh, resources are not needed other than you making a call to your doctor and saying, hey, I have these symptoms and they're saying to you that, hey, stay at home and let's observe you. Then I have said it before as well, 14% of the cases are going to be severe or serious. So these are the people who would develop. So this shortness of breath belongs here. They would develop shortness of breath. This is serious because short, shortness of breath would mean there is damage happening inside the, inside the um, respiratory system. And it is an indication that the disease is progressing it is an indication that we need to have medical intervention. Otherwise, there is going to be damage to your, uh, your systems and possibly uh, life-threatening outcomes can be there. So shortness of breath is a very, very important um, outcome that is to be monitored. And even in that case, normally the management here is that if you have fever, if you have shortness of breath, then let's monitor you. And if the shortness of breath progresses, then please come in and become admitted, go to the emergency room and become admitted. And I have uh, talked about it in the past, that shortness of breath really means that um, whatever you do, for example, I'm doing a lecture right now, the things that you do commonly, if you have started becoming breathless when doing it, so if I started becoming breathless while talking with you, then I have developed shortness of breath. And if it persists, then I have a problem. Remember, shortness of breath can be because of anxiety as well. Sometimes we become panicky and we have shortness of breath too because we are, we are breathing fast and washing out carbon dioxide and that would cause a feeling of shortness of breath. So shortness of breath has many other reasons, but nowadays when you develop it, you should be concerned, talk with your doctor. So in this case, shortness of breath, they are going to ask you if it persists or progresses, they're going to ask you to come to the hospital. And I'll talk about that in a second. Then is the 5% of the cases which will become critical, which I've talked about it in the past, that they are going to need um, acute respiratory distress syndrome management. They are going to need multiple organ failure management. They are going to need septic shock management. And these are the patients. These are the two groups that we are going to talk about what kind of management 
medical management is done there. So for that, I'm going to take the um, uh, I'm going to take the example first of all of the Jiangsu province from China. So if I quickly show, here is the Jiangsu province's um, uh, paper from their doctors that how did they start managing the patients who had become serious or critical. So here is what they had done. I, I am really impressed by them. So they had a very good case fatality rate as well. They had a lower case fatality rate. They had better patient outcomes and their resources were aligned correctly as well. So here is what they did in general. What they did was they said, fine, if we have received a patient who is, um, who is serious, that means they, they have shortness of breath. So here is that patient. What they did was they did their tests, you know, the regular lymphocyte and RBCs and chest x-rays and CTs and everything. So after doing their regular routine tests, they assessed if this patient is low risk or high risk. Based on the chest x-ray, based on the CT scan, based on the WBC count and so on. So based on those criteria, they would assess if the patient is low risk or high risk. If the patient is low risk, then they would monitor the patient twice a day. They would admit that patient. They would mo monitor them twice a day for temperature to see if they are developing temperature or not, or what is their temperature. And if they are high risk, then they would continuously monitor them for temperature, for heart rate, for breathing rate. So what would happen is now if the oxygen saturation, so PO2 is lesser than 93%, or if the heart rate or respiration rate has become greater than 30, or if the heart rate has become greater than 120, so these are or, so if oxygen saturation dropped, that means there is something, some problem with the lungs and oxygen is not exchanging correctly or it is not going into the blood correctly from the environment. If that happened or, or respiration rate increased, which is also another indication that the lungs are not working correctly, or heart rate increased, which is another indication that the blood pressure is dropping and heart is having to work harder to provide the correct blood pressure and volume to the tissues. All of these, any one of them, was their, um, their criteria to say that the patient needs to go to ICU. So they called it early warning system. That as soon as, so as they're monitoring patients and managing them, as soon as they would see that any one of these red flags triggered, they immediately moved the patient to ICU and handed them over to the people who are gonna manage for the septic shock and multiple organ failure. So this was their basic organization. This was their basic structure or process flow. And they say that their, uh, I think, case fatality rate was, I think, 3.3%, while in the Hubei province, in the Wuhan area, the case fatality rate was 4.4%. So they had a better outcome just by making sure that they had a proper process. Then in the ICU, if they felt... So the way they managed the patient in the ICU were very interesting as well. So what they had done was, one, they, tr they tried non-invasive ventilation. So maybe high flow nasal oxygen. So through the nasal uh, route, high flow oxygen. That is what they tried. They, they tried the non uh, or the fluid, fluid sparing resuscitation which means what? Look, in this particular disease, when the lungs become diseased, lungs start filling up with fluid. So we start drowning in our own fluid or the inflammation starts occurring in the lung and acute respiratory distress syndrome occurs, which then causes the alveoli and the interstitial tissue to become filled with inflammatory exudates. And that causes the oxygen and the gas exchange to become hindered. So what they did was they would resuscitate for the septic shock, that is a drop in blood pressure. They would help the patient keep maintain the blood pressure by giving 
drugs that would cause vasoconstriction by giving drugs that can help heart to have better contraction if heart is capable of doing that. If it is already in tachycardia, then you would not do this. You would just take care of the blood vessels and constrict them without giving too much fluids so that you do not aggravate the pulmonary edema and the situation pulmonary inflammation and the exudates inside the lungs. So that was their fluid sparing resuscitation. And then finally, if needed, they would do the they would do the um, ventilation first non-invasive and then if that doesn't work so they would do these things and they would continue to monitor in if, if the patient becomes aggravated then they would put them on invasive uh, mechanical ventilation imv invasive mechanical ventilation if the patient becomes starts becoming okay they would of course take them towards discharge route so this was their process that first they receive a patient and that is serious or critical patient. Of course, critical would directly go to the ventilation, but they would receive a patient who is in serious situation, shortness of breath. They would look at that patient to see if they are low risk or high risk based on their basic lab data. Then they would start monitoring them. If they are low risk, they would monitor them twice for temperature. If they are high risk, they would continuously monitor them. And then based on these three criteria, they would decide if the patient needs to go to the ICU. If the patient starts recovering, then the patient will move towards discharge from here. But if the patient starts becoming aggravated, any one of these flags become triggered, then they would send the patient to ICU. Inside the ICU, then now they would give high flow oxygen or they would plus they may need to do the fluid resuscitation if the septic shock has started and they may need to do non-invasive ventilation. If these measures do not work, then they'll put the patient on the invasive mechanical ventilation. If this starts working, then the patient will be discharged. So that was their process. In this process, again, if you see, there are no drugs involved. This is their process discussion that they have done, and they have said that they reduced the case fatality rate by this um, process. Now, I wanna go to the next stage here, and that is medical, that means drugs, medical interventions. And in the medical interventions, I want to talk about number one, corticosteroids. Corticosteroids. Then I want to talk about um, remdesivir, antiviral. Then chloroquine, I have talked at length about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So I'll just touch upon that. And then um, other drugs that may be contenders in there. And what is the basic um, outcome of these drugs? So let me just say in, so I, I wanna talk about azithromycin as well. So there's a French study about that. So let me just say generally, corticosteroids, WHO, CDC says do not use them. So I'll show you the study that say that corticosteroid can actually, in the previous uh, infections with MERS and SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-1 in 2002 and MERS in 2012, the steroids actually caused a harmful effect by prolonging the time of stay in the hospital and by increasing the, the viral load by reducing the inflammatory processes. So corticosteroids are contraindicated. I've seen some hospitals protocols and they are using corticosteroids as well. I think it, it goes case by case. If there is a case that must need corticosteroids, so you know better and, the, and you and your triage should know what is the right approach for that specific patient. But generally corticosteroids are supposed to be more harmful than helpful in coronavirus uh, infections. Then is the remdesivir. Remdesivir is supposed to be really, really good. Um, and I'll talk about that. Chloroquine plus azithromycin, they, they alone, chloroquine works very good. I've talked about it. And with azithromycin, it kind of, azithromycin increases the effectiveness of chloroquine. And there is a study, there's not exactly a study, it's an open label 
study with a small sample size, but they in France and they they say that they were able to cure all hundred percent of the patients taking part part in the study. I think there were twenty two patients. So let's talk about these one by one. First of all, the uh, corticosteroids. So if I go back here. So look at this, this is the CDC site. CDC's own recommendation for the patients is remdesivir. And they are not saying that we are recommending that you go do it. They are saying this is a promising drug and here are the trials that are happening. So if you wanted to enroll in the trial, they have given you the links. So they're not saying go use remdesivir, but they are saying this is a promising drug and there are trials. Then they are standing behind hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine by saying that there has been there have been studies that show there is a promise, but once again, they're not saying that we recommend that you use it. And they are once again saying that there are clinical trials for that as well. But what they have done is they have linked studies here, which shows you that there are people, there are doctors who have done these studies and they have their outcomes and they have lined those outcomes down here. Other than those drugs, for example, lopinavir or itinavir, these, these have not made any good uh, sense, so they have not stood behind them. So with this, let's look at the corticosteroids. Corticosteroids, especially in case of the COV diseases, that was SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. The study showed that there was not enough benefit of corticosteroids instead there was actually um, damage so let me see so here clinical evidence does not support corticosteroid treatment for 2019 and cov or sars cov 2 so there is this uh, study here and if you see this table is very very interesting what they did was they did a meta-analysis of the studies that were done before for MERS and for SARS-CoV and even for influenza and uh, respiratory syncytial uh, virus, syncytial virus. So look, in MERS-CoV, they found out that there is delayed clearance of viral RNA from respiratory tract. So corticosteroids actually delayed the clearance of the virus. In the SARS-CoV, which was the first time the SARS outbreak occurred in 20, 2002, they saw that delayed clearance of the RNA from the blood, the complications and psychosis, complication of diabetes, complication of avascular necrosis, complication of, um, so in the influence increased mortality and so on. So there were so many complications during the disease process and after the disease process that the analysis was, the conclusion was that corticosteroids overall no unique reason exist to expect that patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection will benefit from corticosteroids. So corticosteroids are not valuable. They are not useful. In fact, they can delay the, I went through those studies and I looked at what they were looking at, the researchers. In fact, what happens is that in case of coronaviruses, the delay, corticosteroids are delaying the clearance of the virus in the body. But again, it would depend upon your doctor and the way they are looking at your milieu, your body, and seeing what other diseases and comorbidities are present and what kind of uh, steroid support is needed. So there may be steroid support needed, but this is a general statement here that corticosteroids for coronavirus are not very useful. Then is the remdesivir. Now remdesivir is a very, very interesting drug. What it does is it's, we call it a broad spectrum antiviral. What this does is we'll I think we talked about it before as well. When the virus RNA comes in to the cell, the virus RNA needs to be replicated. It needs to be transcribed. So it needs to become messenger RNA. So that is the transcription. When we take RNA and we make protein from it, that is called translation. But when we take a piece of RNA, or DNA and we make messenger RNA from it that is called transcription. Transcription is usually an intermediate process step which is necessary before the proteins can be formed. So imagine that all viruses would need to do transcription. 
this virus, coronavirus, needs to do transcription. What remdesivir does is, I'm going to make it in blue, it actually mimics one of the nucleotides, one of the bases for the RNA, and it gets stuck on it as, as a base. But when the, the, um, replicate, the translational systems come in, or transcription system come in, and they encounter remdesivir sitting on the RNA, they terminate their function of transcribing. So not translation, transcribing. So the result is messenger RNA, RNA production is not correct. The messenger RNA that is formed is now damaged RNA. So instead of the whole body forming, they just make an arm and then the transcription stops. So the result of that is that damage and messenger RNA does not allow the viruses to be formed. And so that is how this drug is antiviral. And you can imagine that this is a generic or global broad spectrum antiviral. It has been used for many other uh, virus diseases. Here it showed, so they have not done a study on SARS-CoV-2. There, there are observations, there are literature that is developing, but the studies are on uh, SARS and on MERS. So if I can quickly go to those studies. Um, so here, chloroquine, um, trial of lopinavir and ritonavir. So this was a study that said that this is not useful. I wanted to make sure that I show you the remdesivir as well. Therap so here, so this is a study in nature.com that is comparative therapeutic efficacy of remdesivir in combination lupinavir and ritunavir and interferon beta against MERS-CoV. So MERS-CoV, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, not COVID-19. So even then, in this um, beautiful paper, what they have talked about is a couple of things that are very interesting. Number one, they say that remdesivir does work against coronavirus, at least with the MERS, so possibly it can work here as well for the COVID-19. Second thing that I really felt great about was that in humans, the let's say that I become sick today. There is from the day of the start of the symptoms, so if I start coughing today, there is usually seven to 10 days before the viral peak appears in my body. Remdesivir needs a little bit time to do its function and we are fortunate that because from the day of the symptom to the peak, there is a very good window of time. If we start giving remdesivir over here, then it has ample time to start, it has ample time to start reducing the viral replication and reduce the viral load or viral carriage viral load or virus load or virus carriage that is the amount of viruses that are replicating in me and i'm carrying them with me so it actually reduces them and there is one more thing when the virus load reduces when the number of viruses in me reduce then the result of that is that the inflammation system inflammatory response in my body also reduces because my immune system doesn't see a lot of viruses so it doesn't become it doesn't go mad it doesn't say i'm going to beat up everything in my way and so inflammatory response reduces which is a positive thing because it reduces in sync with the less um, virus corticosteroids reduces inflammatory response uh, response out of sync with the virus replication so virus is replicating but the inflammatory response is low and so virus clearance becomes a problem here the inflammatory response is reduced in sync with the reduced replication and reduced inflammatory response is good because it doesn't cause damage to the lungs and so the lungs stay protected so not only the viral load reduces damage to the lungs also reduces, which is a great outcome. So remdesivir, at least for MERS-CoV, it has been studied to be great. Then is the chloroquine. I talked about it yesterday as well. So today I'm only going to talk about chloroquine. So there is another video with the chloroquine. I have talked about it for how does it work with in three ways. I actually think that there is a fourth way as well, and that is the ACE receptor binding. It deforms that receptor. So I forgot to mention that yesterday. Uh, so chloroquine and azithromycin in combination. So there is a study, open label study coming from France. 
and let me just quickly show you that study um, So here, hydrochloroquine and azithromycin as a treatment for COVID-19 results of an open-label label, non-randomized clinical trial. So it's not the best kind of clinical trial, but in the ongoing pandemic and war, I think this is a good enough thing to at least bind our hopes to this uh, medical therapy. So they had done this um, study on 22 patients and here conclusion was Despite its small sample size, our survey shows that hydrochloroquine treatment is significantly associated with load reduction disappearance in COVID-19 patient and, is, and its effect is reinforced by azithromycin. So what they're saying is, I mentioned chloroquine yesterday as well. So it is doing its function to reduce the viral load even to the extent that it may actually disappear. So what they did was they took the patients they gave them these two drugs for six days and they took their uh, swab every day to check the viral load. And, and they, they didn't have a control, uh, control population of the patients, but the, the patients that refused, the patients that were present in the other centers, they used them as a negative control and used them as, a, as an example to compare against this. And what they found was that in this case, chloroquine alone reduce the viral load, I think, by 51%. And then given with azithromycin, azithromycin, they believe, augmented or increased the effect of chloroquine enough that 100% of the patients became cured in six days or they didn't have the viral load anymore. So, of course, this study need more, um, more assessment. It needs to be replicated in other areas. It needs to be checked more but this is something that they have uh, said that they believe in so from this for me what what is clear is steroids may not be useful remdesivir chloroquine and azithromycin seem to be the drugs of choice to start giving as a treatment in serious cases and in critical cases in critical cases of course we will need much more therapeutics maybe um, uh, the antibiotics are needed for the secondary infections, maybe the renal support or cardiac support and the drugs for those are needed, vascular drugs are needed for the uh, vasoactivity to maintain the blood pressure and so on. So once the patient is in the critical state, there is more to be done and it's out of my scope to help that, uh, provide that over here. But for a serious case, it seems like quick, as soon as the symptoms are there, Putting them on remdesivir, chloroquine, azithromycin seem to be a very good uh, approach towards the medical therapy. Again, look at the process. There is a process as well. So this is what we have for today. Let me just see in my notes if there is anything else that needs to be discussed. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I wanted to discuss a couple of more things. One is pregnant women. and what to, how to manage them. So I looked at the CDC site. Let's look at it together. The CDC doesn't have much for the sorry about this here pregnancy and bre breastfeeding. So if you look at it, this is CDC.gov for most of the things, we do not currently know if pregnant women have a greater chance. If you say, how can pregnant women protect themselves, should do the same as the others. Can COVID-19 cause problems for pregnancy? We do not know. Can COVID-19 be passed from a pregnant? We still do not know. So most of the time, what they're saying is, we are not aware of the right data to be able to say one way or the other. However, they're saying that if you are pregnant, then... Um, breastfeeding is very important because breastfeeding will have antib antibodies that are necessary for the child to have and now maybe you breastfeed them in a way that is protective of the child so maybe there is a pump that is used properly cleaned and that pump is then used to extract the milk or express the milk and then somebody else brings the milk to the child and feeds them or if you feed them then you have the mask properly um, your mouth covered and the, the body clean 
and hands washed and then you uh, breastfeed. So they, they, in that page that I showed you, they believe that breastfeeding should continue because there are important antibodies that the child needs, especially in nowadays. So that should continue, but the care should be taken. So that is one about the breast uh, pregnant women. The second thing I wanted to talk about was diabetes and hypertension. And this is a very common question I continue to get. And the people who are using ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. And so there is a study here. Here are patients with hypertension and diabetes mellitus at increased risk for COVID-19 infection. So what, what they had done was they had gone over other studies, multiple other studies, took data from their meta study and then created a conclusion here. So here is the basic conclusion that they formed. Look, what they're saying is, let's say this is a cell and the cell has ACE receptor on it. When we give drugs that are ACE inhibitors, so angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, or when we give drugs that are ACE receptor blockers, so they block this area by sitting on it, what a cell does is, in response, it makes more of them. So when we have angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, that would do what? That would reduce the blood pressure? Or when we have ARBs that sit on the receptors and block them, the result will be reduced blood, blood pressure. Body in a hypertensive patient thinks that we need to have a higher blood pressure. So what it does is it sends messages to the cells to say, you guys need to upregulate your receptors. And this is a natural behavior of a cell as well, that when its, its receptors are not functioning correctly or not in enough amount, it upregulates its receptors. That is what happens with nicotine. That is what happens with many other drugs that become um, uh, addicted, uh, that we become addicted to. Their, their receptors become overexpressed. So here, the ACE receptor become overexpressed because both in diabetes or in hypertension, one can take ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker drugs. So both of these populations have this problem that they have more than normal number of receptors for ACE on them. And we know that the virus, this coronavirus, binds to ACE receptors through its spike protein. So this is the S protein. So imagine if you are a patient or if I am a patient, I don't want to use you as an example, let's say I'm a patient of diabetes and I'm taking, or hypertension, and I'm taking angiotensin receptor blockers, that would have my cells express more of the ACE2 receptors. And now comes the virus, and he finds so many more receptors to bind with, and he would infect more cells and more rapidly. So that study concluded that they feel, this is a hypothesis, it's a meta-analysis of the studies, they have made a hypothesis, it's not a conclusion, but they said we are hypothesizing that the patient who are diabetics and on these drugs or uh, hypertensive and on these drugs may have upregulated ACE2 receptors which may lead to fatal coronavirus infections. So I wanted to make sure that I have that discussion, discussion done as well. So this is what I have for today's discussion of management. We talked about containment, delay and then mitigation. Containment has its own ways of working. Uh, some countries showed a very good progress. They, their delay, social distancing and uh, removing the gatherings or reduced gathering has its own way. Some countries failed to show that and some countries did a very good job. And then is the medical studies. Uh, for the milder cases, really just the symptomatic treatment stay at home. For severe and uh, critical cases, one, there is a Jinx, uh, Jiangsu provinces process for how to manage them and then there is the medical treatment which generally says don't use corticosteroids use remdesivir use hydroxychloroquine use azithromycin and that is the uh, important thing pregnant women not much information other than hey keep yourself protected and keep your child protected and diabetes and hypertension those patients that are using ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers they may be at a higher risk of becoming critical 
when the virus comes in because it's going to use those extra receptors to go into their uh, cells and cause infections. So thank you very much for your time and talk to you later. Stay safe and stay healthy.